If you are watching this video, then we have piqued your curiosity in watching the most factual true crime series on YouTube. True Crime, Man's Dark Imagination. And now, here is your host, Alan Gotro. Bella Poole's daughter believed in a warped delusion of the American dream, believing that her financial well-being stemmed from prostituting herself to the point of gaining gullible men's confidences, taking their money, and then murdering them. This story is somewhat demented and people still believe that she escaped justice. You be the judge. On April 28, 1908, a middle-aged woman visited an attorney to write her last will and testament. A woman of substantial means, she stipulated within the document that should she pass, her children would inherit all of her possessions and holdings. If the children died, the estate would revert to the Norwegian children's home. The attorney looked at the woman and stated that he needed the official name of the orphanage in order to authorize the will. The middle-aged woman became frustrated and stated, there's no time to wait. The attorney reluctantly signed the will, certifying it to a legal standing. The middle-aged woman seemed in a hurry to make sure that the document was official. What was the rush? For this woman, it was an act. It seemed that this once attractive matron felt that her life may be in danger. But later facts emerged that this was exactly the opposite. She was the danger, and anyone who crossed her path or witnessed her crimes met a certain fate, a fate that ended with a cold, dirt grave. Born Bella Pulstadter in Trondheim, Norway, to a successful stonemason, Bella had two brothers and a sister. The brothers followed in the family business, and when the sister was old enough to leave, she traveled to America on her own. Shortly after her arrival in the United States, Anna Pullstotter married a man from Chicago named John Larson. Knowing that her sister Bella lacked any substantial skills to remain in her native land, Anna invited her sister to America to stay with the Larsons. Bella went to America in 1883 at the age of 24. Bella landed in the United States and while in Chicago, where her sister and brother-in-law settled, Bella met a young security guard named Mads Sorensen. Immediately after the couple married, they tried to conceive children, but the venture proved unsuccessful. Instead, being in a stable financial position at the time, they adopted children from parents in their neighborhood who could not afford to raise those children. The Sorensons eventually adopted three, Jenny, Myrtle, and Lucy. Although family life proved happy, the family had to keep moving due to frequent fires. Over the course of the Sorensen marriage, they had to move three times because fires engulfed their residences. Luckily, no one was hurt. Furthermore, the Sorensons owned a small grocery store in Chicago that did not see a profit until the building burned down. At the time, Bella Americanized her name to Belle, and neighbors remembered her as being a great wife to Mads and a doting mother who only raised her voice to scold the children. In early 1900, Mad suddenly became ill and subsequently died. His symptoms had been chest pains and those occurred on the day of his death. The doctor then signed the death certificate with a heart attack being the cause. After Mad's death, Bell found herself with $8,000 in life insurance money, a large sum in those days. With this tragic windfall, Belle packed the children up and held her money close as the family moved to Laporte, Indiana. When Belle and the children arrived, she contacted the local Norwegian community, a conclave that her dead husband mentioned to her several times and he even had plans to retire there. Belle decided that the family would put down roots in the Indiana community 
and bought a farm not too far from the city limits. It turned out that the house she purchased once belonged to a local madam and when she died at a ripe old age, the property fell into disrepair. The house paralleled McClung Road and stood on the edge of a swamp to one side and an orchard on the other. The house stood two stories high and appeared made with red brick on the outside. When Belle and the girls moved in, they set about airing the house, which reeked of cheap perfume and cigars. Drawing the support of her neighbors, Belle realized that they disliked a house of ill repute in their neighborhood and appreciated Belle's willingness to bring the house back to a respectable fashion. The house contained six bedrooms, a large dining area, large bedrooms, a long kitchen, and a high beam ceiling. Kerosene lamps adorned the hallways and the rooms which seemed to provide more than enough light. Carpenters and craftsmen worked to bring the house to some sort of grandeur, again pleasing the neighbors. Almost as soon as Belle arrived in Laporte, she had a new husband, Peter Gunnis, a nearby farmer and widower brought with him an infant son from a previous marriage. His house was not too fancy, but he owned a lot of property. Almost as soon as the two moved in with Belle, the baby contracted a virus and died. The hard work entailed with keeping a farm running soothed the grief the family experienced. Neighbors often cited Belle and Peter in town where they ventured occasionally to sell their meat and trade manure for other supplies needed for the farm. And then, one winter night before the end of 1902, one of the adopted daughters, Jenny, heard a loud crash and rushed downstairs to find her stepfather on the floor of the kitchen, bleeding profusely from a bad wound to his head. Belle, standing over her husband, became inconsolable as she related to her daughter that the big meat grinder they kept in the house fell from a shelf and struck Peter Gunnis in the head. He was dead by the next morning. Over the course of the next several years, Belle received many gentlemen to work on the farm in the hopes that they would turn into a marriage proposal. But soon after the men came to live on the farm and sampled the fruits that Belle was willing to supply, so to speak, they left her during the season when she needed them most, harvest time. Some rumors began to spread that the men did not exactly leave, but they had a habit of mysteriously disappearing. At the point when one of the farmhands became a suitor, he vanished without much of a trace with Bell merely stating that he disappeared or ran off with another woman. One of these men, Peter Carlson, talked marriage with Bell, but then he was nowhere to be found a few weeks later. A young 19-year-old man, Emil Greening, often came to the farm to offer his services, but the young man's interests lay more with Jenny, Bell's teenage foster daughter, rather than with the much older, matronly Bell. When Jenny left for college in California, the young man appeared heartbroken and therefore never offered his services to Bell after that. In the spring of 1907, however, Bell approached a 30-year-old all-round maintenance man named Ray Lamphere. Lamphere took to working on Bell's land very quickly and made some money as he had an alcoholic addiction to support. Lamphere took up residence in a room on the second floor of Bell's house but the relationship soon blossomed into a full-fledged affair. Bell and Lamphere were seen around the town arm in arm, and the young bachelor professed that she seduced him because she heard he was quite the man. Lamphere even sported a gold watch that Bell had given him to his drinking buddies whenever he stepped away from the farmstead. The affair between Lamphere and Bell did not last long, some of the townspeople surmised, because Bell was soon seen with another gentleman as the two went shopping for a wedding ring at Oberreich's department store. Lamphere appeared stunned when someone gave him the news. Lamphere, in several drunken rants, stated that females were no good and he often stayed drunk for days. One day, when he learned that the new suitor who desired Belle's hand in marriage had suddenly disappeared, Lamphere felt some relief and thought of a way to get back into Belle's graces. But then she appeared with a new suitor no sooner had the previous one disappeared. Described as a large Swede, Andrew Helgeline, it seemed that Belle had finally found happiness and noticed that whenever Helgeline walked into town, there was a spring in his step and an air of glee with Belle draped over the big Swede's arm. 
Helgeline went to a bank in South Dakota to withdraw funds so that he could return to Laporte and marry Bell. He even said as much to the teller at the bank. Bell also informed Lamphere that he needed to find another residence as she was allowing Helgeline to stay in the spare room until the wedding. Lamphere did not respond well to the news and quit his employment with Bell, cursing her later that night at one of the local bars. A week had passed. Bell cried on a neighbor's shoulder that she never learned from her mistakes. Helgeline left her too, or at least that's what she told the neighbor. Bell asked Lamphere to return, but he refused, forcing the middle-aged woman to rely on a good worker named Joe Maxson. It appeared that Maxson never expressed a romantic or sexual interest in Bell, as on most evenings he worked late on the farm and then retired to his room to read the local newspapers or play haunting music on his violin. The children seemed content as they went to sleep due to the soothing nature of Maxson's playing. Ray Lamphere returned every once in a while to harass Bell, and Maxson warned her on the occasions when the embittered ex-suitor returned. Bell even had him arrested on several occasions for trespassing. Maxson often saw Lamphere spying on the homestead from a grove of elm trees on the edge of the property. On the evening of April 27, 1908, subsequent to the preparation of Bell's last will and testament, a fire broke out at the farm and nearly destroyed the whole property. As far as a suspect, local authorities arrested the one individual they believed had the motive to see any harm come to Bell, Ray Lamphere. Several days after the fire, Lamphere sat in the Laporte jail, suspected of starting the fire and thus murdering Bell Gunnis in the process. The headless corpse of a female had been found under the rubble of the house and authorities believed this to be Bell Gunnis. However, they failed to prove that at the time of Lamphere's arrest. Furthermore, town gossip seemed to be swayed in Lamphere's favor that he neither murdered Bell or set the fire to the farm. Additionally, none of the townspeople actually believed that the corpse found belonged to Bell Gunnis. It was then that authorities, at the behest of the local population, looked more closely into Belle Gunnis as most of her suitors, according to the middle-aged woman, disappeared without warning. Questions arose as to whether Jenny Sorensen, Belle's young daughter who allegedly broke the heart of 19-year-old Emil Greening, actually left the farm to attend college in San Francisco. Although it took a little time, Laporte authorities contacted the college that Jenny was supposed to attend, according to Bell Gunnis, and they responded that they had no record of the young girl. Queries also surfaced that Bell seemed to be living a somewhat wealthy lifestyle, even though the farm never seemed to make any money. Where did the living expenses come from? As volunteers and law enforcement personnel dug through the rubble of the fire, Answers to their questions became apparent. Men's watches, men's coat buttons, billfolds, all empty of course, were found in the debris. Then, more grisly discoveries. A human rib cage that appeared recently buried, a skeletal arm, then a whole skeleton was discovered in the rubble. Because of the hideous nature of the accusations that surfaced around Bell Gunnis, town sheriff Al Smutzer wanted to keep the incident quiet until more evidence could be found at the scene of the fire. He hired Joe Maxson, Bell's former handyman, and a close neighbor, Daniel Hudson, to quietly sift through the rubble to see if they could locate the female head of the corpse, in addition to any other evidence they may find. Most importantly, Maxson and Hudson needed to keep whatever they found quiet. However, with hundreds of gawkers passing by the fireside every day, it became difficult to conceal findings as they occurred. In May of 1908, a small diminutive man visited Sheriff Smutzer and claimed that he was Ashley Helgeline, the younger brother of Andrew. Ashley stated to authorities that he knew his brother arrived in South Dakota to withdraw funds from an account there, claiming that Bell was by his side at the withdrawal. Ashley knew when his brother arrived back in Laporte, Indiana, and then read in the Norwegian newspaper about the fire on Bell Gunnis' farm. Ashley came to investigate. Ashley explained to the authorities that he and his family 
found approximately six months' worth of letters that his brother and Bell wrote back and forth to each other, as Andrew found an advertisement in a mail-order bride column in the Scandinavian, the local newspaper in Norway. The letter specifically stated that Andrew was to travel to Laporte, where he and Bell would then be married at her urging. Ashley also stated that Andrew entrusted Bell with over $1,800 of his savings, and he found it strange that his brother just left the money with her. Law enforcement then deciphered some of the written letters and denoted that Bell really desired money more than a man who was a faithful husband, lover, and provider for her family. The later letters gave Andrew instruction as to sewing paper money into his underwear when he traveled and not to breathe the word of those instructions to anyone, not even his closest relations. Sheriff Smutzer doubted the rendition of Ashley's story as the lawman believed Bell not to be a gold digger per se, but Ashley remained unconvinced that Bell was completely innocent in the disappearance of his brother. After all, Ashley Helgeline knew that digging took place at Bell's former residence and believed evidence of his brother's existence, or demise, may be found there. After relating the story of how his brother came to America at Bell's behest, Ashley went to speak to Maxon and Hudson because he felt somewhat of a hunch about the disappearance of his brother and who, at the time, may have been responsible. He offered to help the two men dig and questioned them as to whether Bell ever dug holes on her own. Maxon responded, As a matter of fact, yes. There's a large garbage pit behind the house near the hog pen where she had been throwing old boots, ham bones, coffee tins, things like that. She had me cover it in around March. Why? Without replying to Maxon, Ashley retrieved a shovel and went to the area described by Maxon and began to dig. Because of his belief that his brother may have fallen victim to foul play at Bell's hands, the other two, almost immediately, began assisting with Ashley's excavation of the former garbage heap. After just a few minutes of digging, the three men found some old boots and then were hit with such a smell of decay they had to air out their lungs by moving away from the spot. As they continued digging in the spot, they discovered some old clothing and then something that had been covered with an oil cloth and a gunny sack. When they lifted the covering, they found a human arm. Digging further, they found the remains and Ashley recognized the head with the grin to be that of his brother. The three men later discovered this man had been buried in pieces, his arms, legs, hands, and head, all buried in old flour sacks. Maxon, Hudson, and Ashley immediately summoned Sheriff Smutzer to the scene to observe their most recent discoveries. Throughout the continuing excavation, the three men, along with other volunteers, uncovered the bodies of two females and two males. The female body had been identified as Jenny Sorensen. Even though the remains decomposed rapidly, the authorities noted her blonde hair and facial features were still intact. Rumors quickly circulated that Jenny's suspicions arose about her foster mother when she noticed that suitors always left the residence in the middle of the night. The news of the discoveries quickly spread throughout Indiana, the Midwest, and finally the country, with other stories surfacing in Norway about the lonely Bell Gunness. Sheriff Smutzer could no longer contain the interest with the morbid finds, and soon the town became overrun with news media. Newsmen invaded the small town and took over the largest hotel there as a command center of sorts, deciphering any further stories that may arise from the excavations at the farm. When interviewing many of the local women about Bell Gunness, they appeared shocked that this once alleged genteel woman was described as being a lady bluebeard. The portrait of a hate-filled, money-grubbing immigrant soon became the news of the day. Questions surfaced as to all the farmhands that worked for Bell in hopes of courting her at the same time. Ole Budsberg, one of the farmhands that expressed his wish to be Bell's beau, went to the local bank to withdraw $1,800 while being escorted by the widow. Soon thereafter, Budsberg disappeared. When the cashier at the bank inquired as to where Budsberg may have gone, Bell answered with a great confidence that Budsberg moved to Oregon. Swan Nicholson, a recent resident to Laporte, 
asked about the whereabouts of a friend he knew, Olaf Lindblow. Nicholson described Lindblow as young, about 30 years old, and a very handsome fellow. One of Bell's neighbors, Chris Christofferson, answered Nicholson's query by telling him that he remembered seeing Lindblow on Bell's property when he moved a privy off of the hole underneath it at the time. Christofferson related that Bell complained that once Lindblow moved the privy and failed to move it back, he left for St. Louis and she never saw him again. Then there was Henry Gerholt. He came to Laporte and worked in the outdoor market there. He seemed very nice to the other residents and even more so to Bell. Henry helped Bell around her farm and then one day she stated he left and ran off with a horse trader. Bell's farm appeared to be a revolving door of farmhands as she went through so many that townspeople could not remember their names nor could they attest to ever learning them. One boy, in particular, worked with Bell and he was seen about the town with her on several occasions. One day, when Bell went to the butcher shop, Someone asked her about the whereabouts of the boy and she turned to a large piece of hanging beef and remarked what a lovely cut it would make. Soon, townspeople were aghast at remembering exactly how many farmhands and suitors that Bell had who suddenly left. In the middle of the night, of course. The digging at Bell's farm continued and the fate regarding the missing men and boys became apparent. Throughout the month of May, Searchers discovered the remains of Budsberg, Gerholt, and the young man that no one else could remember his name. Remains found had their heads detached from their bodies and their various other limbs scattered throughout their graves. At the bottom of one of the graves, searchers discovered the remains of a young boy whose wisdom teeth just started to come in at the time of his death. With these most recent revelations, an accusatory shadow descended upon Bell Gunnis. Was she also responsible for the death of Mad Sorensen? And Peter Gunnis, with his skull crushed by a meat grinder that mysteriously fell from the top shelf in the kitchen of the Gunnis home. A doctor from Chicago, J.B. Miller, examined Sorensen at the time of his death and determined that the man exhibited signs of strychnine poisoning. But due to the suggestion of a superior, Dr. Miller never mentioned these details to Belle Gunnis at the time of her husband's death so as to not cause her any more undue grief. Since Dr. Miller also treated Sorensen for a heart condition, he felt that the listing of a heart attack would not be seen as mysterious. Dr. Miller remained silent for the eight years from Sorensen's death to the fire in Laporte. Strangely enough, Sorensen just happened to expire when two life insurance policies seemed to overlap each other, therefore doubling the money that Bell received. A year later, when Peter Gunnis died from the fractured skull, law enforcement expressed some suspicion in that case as well. The death bore the marks of what law enforcement considered mischief, and Bell gave the investigators no reasonable explanation as to how the meat grinder could have fallen the way it did and crushed her husband's skull. Police were so suspicious at the time that they even questioned whether Bell had anything to do with Peter Gunnis's young son's death who was under her care at the time the little one died. Authorities questioned Jenny about the incident and her step-parents' relationship with each other, even hinting that they believed that Bell murdered her husband in cold blood. Even at Peter Gunnis's funeral, observers noticed that Bell moaned and whimpered as she covered her eyes with her hands. Every once in a while, as noticed by one of the mourners, she kept peeking alertly between them, her fingers, to check the effect she was making. Bell's behavior certainly drew the suspicions of several of the mourners who truly believed she was responsible for the death of her husband, if not the murderer herself. Her own daughter, Myrtle, believed that her mother murdered her father when she told a schoolmate that Bell hit Peter with a meat cleaver and killed him. The excavators continued to dig throughout the month of May and failed to locate a body that matched Bell's. This is not to say that the authorities believed that Ray Lamphere was not her accomplice. The district attorney pushed hard for an indictment, even while the digging continued and Sheriff Smutzer brought pressure to bear upon the diggers to find something that pointed to Lamphere as the murderer. However, any defense mounted on Lamphere's behalf could point to the fact that all of Bell's children, Jenny, Myrtle, and Lucy, had been discovered in the rubble of the fire, 
but any female corpse matching that of Belle Gunnis failed to appear. In order to secure an indictment, Sheriff Smutzer instructed his deputies and detectives to search high and low for any evidence implicating Lam Fear on the murders of the children. While investigators searched for the evidence to bring charges against Lam Fear, an unusual character stepped forward that claimed he could possibly help them with their investigation. Dr. Ira Norton, Belle Gunnis' dentist, stated that if the diggers could find her head, he could identify whether the false teeth within that head belonged to Belle Gunnis. Dr. Norton stated that he made Belle some false teeth the year before that were backed with some gold fillings. Sheriff Smutzer then received some help from another unlikely source, an old gold miner named Louis Schultz. Schultz stated that if the sheriff provided him with a sluice box, water and material run together over some sort of screen, that he would be able to find those teeth, if they existed, within a week. Sheriff Smutzer, trying anything to get the evidence that he and the district attorney desired to see Lamphere tried for murder, agreed to the request. Some of the citizens of Laporte believed Bell dead because her account at the local bank still had approximately $750 left in it. Others believed Bell met her fate in the fire and Lamphere was the one solely responsible. Even the town's local newspapers could not make up their minds as to whether Bell Gunnis remained alive or succumbed in the fire. Finally, on May 12, 1908, Schultz, after running some dirt through the sluice box, discovered a pair of dentures that Dr. Norton identified as having belonged to Bell Gunnis. On May 22, 1908, a grand jury indicted Ray Lamphere for arson and felonious homicide of all the victims found during the excavations after the fire, including Bell Gunnis. On May 29th, the constabulary held an auction for all the goods that proved salvageable from the fire. Auctioneers sold the family dog that survived the fire, the barn cat with her kittens, and the pony and cart. Joe Maxson, hounded constantly by the press when asked if Bell was still alive, resounded with a firm yes every time asked the question. Maxson considered himself lucky that he escaped the fire and lived to tell about it. He related to his sister some years later that he awoke one evening with Bell standing at the foot of the bed. She asked him whether he was asleep and then promptly left the room. Maxson believed he could see the outline of a hammer beneath her skirt. Stories from her homeland of Norway emerged in the local newspaper, The Scandinavian, that told of narrow escapes by other gentlemen who answered Bell's advertisements for husbands. One of the men, a Carl Peterson, brought a letter to the port authorities that stipulated before she took their proposal seriously every applicant must have a satisfactory deposit of cash or security. George Anderson from Missouri answered Bell's advertisement in a local newspaper and decided to travel to Indiana and investigate the farm. With only $300 in his pocket, Bell strongly suggested that he go back to Missouri, sell his farm, and then she would take his courtship seriously. Anderson decided not to do what Bell desired. It turned out that there were more men that answered Bell's advertisements in the hope of finding that perfect wife. Sheriff Smutzer received letters from other Midwestern families where friends of missing men wanted to discover whether Bell had anything to do with these disappearances. In July 1905, the family of George Barry expressed concerns that Barry left his home in Indiana with $1,500 in his pocket to work for Mrs. Gunnis and no one ever saw him again. Herman Konitzer, also from Indiana, withdrew $5,000 from his bank account and went to Laporte to marry a rich widow. Konitzer vanished without a trace. Abraham Phillips also answered Bell's advertisement and traveled from his home in West Virginia to Laporte to marry a rich woman. Phillips, a retired railway worker, took with him $500 in cash and a diamond ring. The family never heard from Phillips after that, and while Maxson and Hudson sifted through the debris of the fire, they found a railwayman's watch. Another man, Emil Tell, boarded a train from Kansas to Laporte with $5,000 within his billfold, telling his friends and family he was headed there to marry a widow. Again, he disappeared. 
Several other men never materialized after answering Bell's advertisements. Olaf Jensen from Norway, Christian Hinckley from Chetek, Wisconsin, Charles Nyberg from Philadelphia, Tonus Line from Rushford, Minnesota, E.J. Thiefland, Minneapolis, Minnesota, John E. Bunter, McKeesport, Pennsylvania, and the list appeared to be never-ending. On November 9, 1908, the trial of Ray Lamphere began with the choosing of a jury and the final preparations for both the prosecution and the defense. Lamphere pled not guilty. The actual trial opened on Friday morning, November 13th. One of the first witnesses called, coroner Dr. Charles Mack, tried to convince the jury that the headless corpse discovered after the fire was that of Bell Gunnis, although Dr. Mack spoke very authoritatively regarding his findings from the remains he examined. The defense did punch holes in the coroner's credibility, and the jury demonstrated that they doubted whether the headless female corpse found in the rubble was that of Bell Gunnis. Later, their minds would be changed. The defense seemed confident for an acquittal until the dentist, Dr. Norton, not only produced the dentures and identified them, but also Bell's teeth that once had been embedded within her jaw. A morbid souvenir, but these teeth were also found within the rubble of the fire. At this point, the defense lost any ground that they had gained with the discrediting of the coroner, but observers believed that Lamphere would be acquitted. When the trial continued on the following Monday morning, November 16th, the prosecution put Ray Lamphere upon the stand. The defendant testified as to his actions immediately following his firing and how Bell refused to pay him his back wages. The prosecution accused Lamphere of not only being responsible for Andrew Helgeline's death, as well as the fire that everyone believed killed Bell, but that the defendant knew of the graveyard. Another witness called to testify, William Slater, stated that Lamphere, in a drunken state of course, stated that he knew something of Bell that would land her into the penitentiary. The defense then put on their case before the court and called John Anderson, one of Bell's neighbors. Anderson claimed that he saw Bell Gunnis almost two months after the fire walking down the road near his house. Anderson further stated that he had come down from his hayrack and looked toward the orchard where he saw Bell walking with another man. Anderson emphasized that he knew it was her due to the size of the woman, even from a distance. The witness tried to get to the orchard before the couple could make their escape, but Anderson proved too late. Several witnesses testified that they saw Bell after the fire walking in the backwoods around her farm. Rumors spread through the testimony of several witnesses that perhaps Bell engaged a naive body double that she murdered in her place to throw off any law enforcement pursuit. The last witness called to the stand by the defense on November 24, 1908, was Dr. Walter Haynes, a toxicology professor who tested contents of Andrew Helgeline's stomach and discovered large doses of strychnine, more than enough to kill a man. The defense also asked Dr. Haynes to analyze the stomachs of the three young children found after the fire and the headless corpse believed to be Bell. Dr. Haynes testified that the test results from those four examinations would be skewed as all the organs were kept in the same jar as a strychnine solution. Therefore, he would not be able to ascertain whether the stomachs contained the poison or whether the organs absorbed the preservative within the jar. On November 25, 1908, after hearing all the arguments and evidence, the jury found Lamphere guilty of arson and arson only. The jury foreman then stood and made a statement. We hereby state that it was our judgment in consideration of this case that the adult body found in the ruins of the fire was that of Bell Gunnis and that the case was decided by us on an entirely different proposition. The judge then sentenced Lamphere to 2 to 20 years in the state penitentiary. At least, the defendant thought he missed being hanged. A little more than a year after his sentencing, Lamphere contracted tuberculosis and died in prison on December 30, 1909. It appeared, in a philosophical sense, Lamphere became another victim of the matron of the boneyard. At the hour of his death, he admitted to the pastor that he did witness the murder of Andrew Helgeline, 
which prompted him to demand hush money from Gunnis, who, instead, fired him. And when he went back to the farm to retrieve his belongings, she charged him with trespassing. What's more, days before the fire, they had traveled to Chicago to find and bring back a housekeeper who was believed to have become Bell's headless body double in the fire. While incarcerated, Lamphere spoke at length about his predicament to his cellmate, Harry Myers. When Myers was released after serving an indeterminate amount of time for his sentence, he related that Lamphere stated on several occasions that the body the court and the jury believed to be Bell Gunnis possessed no scar on her right thigh. Lamphere reiterated that Bell had a large scar on her right thigh that the corpse did not possess. The LaPorte County Historical Society has stated that sightings of Bell occurred throughout the next 25 years. Even the defense attorney who worked with Lamphere, Wirt Wharton, continued to practice law in LaPorte, Indiana until 1943 when he passed away. Wharton, according to his wife, believed that Bell Gunnis escaped the fire and went on to murder other men. It has been suggested over the years, and even at the time of the fire, as you've seen, that Bell faked her own death. A case occurred on the West Coast that led to substantiating that assumption. In 1931, a woman named Esther Carlson was charged in the poisoning murder of a man named Lindstrom. Carlson died before the trial. Just because she poisoned someone doesn't mean that she was Bell Gunnis. However, authorities later learned that Carlson may have been responsible for other deaths as well. Did Bella Poolstadter escape the fire set primarily to cover her escape? And was she responsible for the deaths that history has attributed to her? Until next time.